Welcome to the start of Module 2 in our journey through introductory astronomy. We're going to be talking in this section, 2.1, and in the next video about moon phases. This video is going to focus on introducing us to some basic ideas, confronting some common misconceptions, and learning the vocabulary that we're going to be using. And the next video is going to be applying that to being able to um, answer some real big questions about uh, what the moon looks like from one night to the next and where to find it. So before we start this topic, I do want you to check in on your current understanding before taking this class, before learning about it. Um, you may have learned about moon phases in a previous class or just kind of picked up on a particular idea. Uh, and so pause the video, read the question and the options and decide what you think best fits your current understanding. All right, so one thing I want to recognize is that um, anytime that we're trying to do these multiple choice questions, we're always trying to apply critical thinking. Sometimes that means ruling out um, options that we know have to be wrong, even if we're not feeling that confident in what option has to be right. So for example, I am hoping that a lot of you ruled out option number one, clouds and Earth's atmosphere, because we can get a um, moon calendar of the entire year, and we can't even really predict clouds for tomorrow, let alone next week. So it can't be clouds that are causing the moon phases, because that would mean that we wouldn't really be able to predict them at all, and we can for years and years and years. So instead, you might have read through these other options, and you may have been swayed by option two here, which is incorrect, but it is the most common misconception, and it's one that we're going to address over the course of two or three different videos um, to really try to convince ourselves um, that it cannot be Earth's shadow that is causing the monthly phases. So instead, it's option number four, our view of the half-illuminated moon changes throughout its orbit. It has to do with the orientation and alignment of the sun, earth, and moon, and we're going to understand through different diagrams and activities what that looks like by the end of a couple of videos. One of the goals that I have for you is to feel more confident when you see the moon in the sky in answering a couple of different questions. I want you to be able to know what phase of the moon you're looking at, I want you to be able to think ahead to what the moon is going to be doing over the next couple of days, both what it will look like and where you'll see it at different times of day. Um, and even if you catch the moon and you don't look down at your watch, do you have enough information to figure out what time it is? And we do actually uh, have that ability once we get to the end of this topic, uh, and it's going to be one that really helps check our understanding of moon phases as a whole. All right. So... Let's tackle a couple of common misconceptions. The first is that there's a single dark side of the moon. This misconception suggests that one side of the moon never gets sunlight and the other side of the moon is always lit up, a light side and a dark side. I have a picture here of a Pink Floyd album, very classic, the dark side of the moon. Let's break this misconception down into a couple of pieces. So first, I want you to think about what is lighting up the moon? Is it creating its own light? Is it reflecting light from somewhere else? It's the sun that lights up the moon in the same way that Earth has daytime and um, Earth has nighttime when the sun is visible on a certain part of the surface uh, or missing. When we talk about this second bullet point, point, what does dark mean? We're simply saying nighttime on the moon times when the sun would not be above the horizon for someone standing on that patch of the moon's surface. So really the misconception is all about asking, does the illuminated side of the moon, the part that's receiving sunlight, change or does it stay the same? So to think about these points a little bit more, I want us to look at this photograph taken in 1968 by astronaut William Anders on board Apollo 8 one of the missions that was part of our lunar program, but it was not yet the one where we had touched down on the moon's surface. So this is a photograph taken of our planet Earth as the spacecraft was coming around the moon in its orbit uh, around the um, surface of the moon. Now, when we look at our beautiful Earth, I want us to recognize a couple of things. When we see that it is not a full circle lit up, I hope that we don't automatically assume 
that it's being covered by the moon shadow or some other shadow all of a sudden, because we know from our everyday experiences on the surface of Earth that Earth has daytime and it has nighttime, and the line in between the day and the night is just sunrise or sunset, depending on our orientation of this um, picture. So instead, I want us to recognize that when we see a partially lit up sphere, it's going to have a finite set of shapes that have nothing to do with the shadow being cast upon that sphere. And in fact, the picture that we see here, the Earth is more than half of a circle. So we would give it a special name for the shape that we're seeing, and that term is going to be one that we introduce in our vocabulary later in the slides, but that shape that we're seeing right now is gibbous. We would be looking at a gibbous Earth, that is the Earth phase if we were living on the Moon. Because what we're seeing is the half of the Earth that is receiving sunlight is not fully aimed towards us, but we are seeing a lot of that half. So we're seeing a lot of the daytime side of the Earth and not a lot of the nighttime side of the Earth. And we also know that there's nowhere on Earth that's always day or always night. So having seen the Earth as photographed from the Moon, let's come back to the Earth and take a photograph of the Moon from Earth. Here are three different pictures of the Moon at different points throughout a month. And I want us to notice a couple of things. First, we're still trying to make sure that we're um, confronting this misconception that there's a single dark side of the moon. So for us to do that, let's see if we can find a crater or pattern that we can see on all three of these images. You can pick any out that you'd like to. I'm going to circle one for us because uh, it's really uh, obvious to me, um, this big, darker uh, region. It's called a mare um, on the moon surface, but it's just a big dark crater that's filled with old lava. Now, if we were to uh, build a moon base right in the middle of that crater, for these three images, it would be lit up all three of those times. But we can see that there's some changes happening. And if we were to wait the entire um, month, we would be in darkness for part of the time. And one of the ways that we can convince ourselves of that is if we instead built our um, cool moon base on one of the much larger mare, uh, maria to the left uh, on these pictures, uh, we would be in darkness in the first of these three photos. We would be in light uh, for the other two, but there's clearly changes happening to the side of the moon that is dark and the side of the moon that is light. But this introduces us to another interesting point. When we look at these three images, we can tell that separate from what's being lit by the sun and not lit by the sun, the set of, um, the set of features that we see, the set of craters and dark spots, that actually stays the same over these three different pictures, and it stays the same over the entire month. So there is not a single dark side of the moon, but there is a single light, uh, a single near side of the moon. So there's not a single dark side of the moon, but there is a single near side of the moon and a single far side of the moon. So we'll be investigating that one quite soon. What that leads us to though, is once we realize that we always see the same view, another misconception pops up. So the misconception is that the moon doesn't rotate. We talked about the Earth rotating on its own axis. That is a day. We talked about that when we talked about the calendar. So every 24 hours, the Earth is rotating. So does the moon rotate? That's a question worth asking. A lot of people, uh, when we're first starting to learn about this, think, well, it can't rotate if we see the same side every time. And I actually want us to try to push back against that. So if we need to keep the same side facing us, for the entire orbit of the moon around the Earth, we have two possible ways to try to do that. Uh, and they are on the slide as A and B. So on the top image in um, part A, this is what would happen if we built this giant uh, arrow statue on the moon and we had it facing off into the, the background of the slide. So we start it facing off into the background on the slide um, where it happens to be starting facing Earth at the bottom of that picture. 
But as it rotates to the right of the picture, now it's facing off into um, the darkness of space. As it continues to orbit behind the Earth, it is facing fully away from the Earth. And we realize that if the moon did not rotate at all and just kind of moved around the Earth like that, we would see all different sides of it because it's never keeping its, um, its side towards us. In part B, instead, what we see is that if we do that same strategy of building this giant arrow statue on the Earth uh, in, the, in the bottom of the bottom image, it's facing towards Earth to begin with, it has to rotate a quarter turn through a quarter of its orbit in order for that arrow to continue to face the Earth. It has to rotate again so that when it's behind the Earth, it's still facing the Earth, and then rotate once more in order to still be facing the Earth. We can see then that in order for us to have this single image all of the time, the moon has to rotate on its axis. And it has to rotate exactly once every time that it orbits the Earth. So a month is the length of time for one orbit and a length of time for one rotation. Kind of cool. And what we're about to find out is that that is not uh, a coincidence. It's called tidal locking. So if we actually look at the moon over the course of a month or so, this, um, this data set that we're looking at is just from um, April 2007. It's a nice, um, helpful um graphic for us, we see that if we actually watch the moon, there is some change over the course of one night to the next, over the course of one week to the next, on what amount of the um, moon we see and how big it looks because uh, the moon is sometimes closer in its orbit to us and sometimes farther. We're going to explore that more in uh, section 2.3. But it's always facing us. And one of the ways that we can kind of think about this is if we are the Earth and we have um, the moon, it's like we're holding hands in an ice rink and just kind of whirling each other uh, around, facing each other the whole time, but anybody watching on the sidelines sees both of us rotating in space. Now, the reason why it will always stay facing us is because it is tidally locked. That is a end result of large, long-term uh, physics processes that is a stable end state. So the moon, when it first formed, was not tidally locked. It rotated on its own, and we rotated on our own, and there was a third separate amount of time where it got, went around the Earth. Um, but over time, it has locked itself to face us. There are other moons in the solar system that are tidally locked to their planets. And for a long time, it was thought that the planet Mercury was tidally locked to the sun. And it's still kind of in process, um, but is not tidally locked. Now, um, when we stop to talk about that, I do want to recognize that this is an ongoing process. The moon is stuck tidally locked to the Earth, but if we were to wait billions of years, the Earth would also be tidally locked to the moon. So there would be a side of the Earth that if you lived, you'd always be able to see the moon in the sky. It would still go through phases. And there'd be a side of the Earth um, that would never see the moon in the sky. Um, and that would be a bummer. Now, when we, um, when we think about that, that would take about 15 billion years. We're going to learn over the course of the semester that there's lots of other astronomy that's going to happen in 15 billion years. So this is probably not going to be something that uh, we wait, wait around to see. But it is an ongoing process. The moon moves about um, an inch and a half every year further away from us. Now, I want to briefly note tides um, because it is part of our... Um, it is part of our textbook. It is relevant to the idea of tidal locking, um, but it's really not key to our curriculum. Mostly the reason I still include it is a lot of people have these um, kind of uh, tales or myths in their head about things that happen at full moon because of the water in our bodies being pulled on by the tides. And what I want us to recognize is that any, any myth that we have about the full moon um, causing strange behavior because of the pull of water, um, tides are very strong at full moon, that is true, but they are also equally as strong at new moon, and no one ever has that in their myth. Um, we're going to be talking about that term, um, but it's two weeks away from full moon, it's when the moon is not uh, observable in the sky because it's kind of following along with the sun. 
Uh, but it is the strongest tides. It doesn't have anything to do with our behavior, but it does have strong tides because the moon and the sun are both working together. Um, and at first quarter and third quarter, we'll be talking about those terms and what they look like from Earth. Those are both situations where tides are very weak. And that means that from high tide to low tide is a much smaller change um, in the height of, um, of water, especially near the ocean. So, um, as I noted, Earth is slowing down and the Moon is moving farther away, and those are large-scale effects that um, it will continue to be small changes over the next 15 billion years, but I don't plan to wait around uh, to see those changes. Okay, so for us to be prepared for the next um, lecture section, um, to be prepared for our real discussion of the critical thinking parts of Moon phases, there's a bunch of vocabulary that we need to feel confident using. I've put it all on this slide. Um, it is in our glossary and I wanna briefly go through it and I wanna make sure that you take the time you need to um, write out the, the definitions in your own words, words that make sense to you, maybe with images. Um, and this drawing here is one that after we have gone through this whole topic, I hope makes a lot more sense to you at the end of the topic. It's one that we'll also see um, me build from scratch in a deeper look video. Okay, so full moon is a term that we have probably heard before. When we look at the direction of sunlight on the image here, um, when we talk about full moon, we are talking about when the moon is at location E, it is on the opposite side of the earth from the sun, and so we are seeing that whole lit up side from our point of view. We are not in Earth's shadow. We have nothing to worry about. We are getting just a regular full moon. It's fully lit up, a full circle. New moon is the opposite. New moon is when we would have to look in the direction of the sun in order to be looking in the direction of the moon. And we're seeing the whole nighttime side of the moon, the dark side, which means we don't actually see it at all. It's happening during the daytime that it's in the sky and it's not lit up and so we really do not get a chance to see new moon. It's not visible to us even though it is there above the horizon. Now the term quarter can be confusing for some folks because we tend to think of a quarter circle and these are half circle moons because what I want us to recognize and what I want us to keep track of in our notes is that quarter refers to how much of the overall process has happened. The first quarter moon happens a quarter of the way into the cycle. The full moon could be called a second quarter moon, but no one calls it that. And then we have the third quarter moon to indicate it's uh, at the end of the third quarter of the cycle. And so new moon could be called fourth quarter, but again, no one calls it that. There are a lot of resources out there that call the third quarter the last quarter, and that's a little mis, um, misleading as well. And so I want to recognize that the first quarter is happening at the end of the first quarter, and the third quarter is happening at the end of the third quarter. Those are more correct terms to use than first and last. And then the word crescent is just a term to describe a shape a shape that is part of a circle, but less than half of a circle. So we can think of crescent moons, we can think of crescent rolls. Um, we have heard that term crescent before. The tricky thing is gibbous is simply a, a shape name. It is a term that we may have never heard before this class, um, or maybe we have heard it in the context of moon phases, but we really do not use it um, in everyday language in any other context. And I don't know if that's simply because there's nothing that really is gibbous shaped rather than oval, um, but a gibbous shape is specifically a portion of a circle that is more than half of a circle, but less than a full circle. So there are two examples on our slide, but all of the moments in between first quarter and full would be a waxing gibbous shape, for example. And then those terms waxing and waning, we are going to see those in action in the next lecture video, but waxing means we are getting more and more illuminated from our point of view, and waning means we are seeing less and less illumination from our point of view. The moon is always going to be half lit up by the sun. Waxing and waning re uh, refer to how those changes occur from our perspective standing on the ground on Earth. So we can have a waxing crescent or a waxing gibbous, 
We can even refer to the first quarter as a waxing quarter, but no one does. Uh, but we could if we felt like it. Now, the overall cycle of all of the different moon phases takes 29 and a half days. That is uh, going from new moon all the way back around to new moon again. When we introduced the day way back in the calendar, we talked about how there's a solar day and a sidereal day, and that's why the, um, the stars shift over the course of the year. What we are referring to is the solar month, and we're not even going to worry about the sidereal month, but it does, it does have that same relative to the background stars idea, and it's a shorter period of time because it takes more time to get all the way back around to new moon. Now, 29 and a half days, um, that's pretty close to four weeks. Let's, in our head, just think of it as four weeks. That's going to be extremely relevant to our ability to kind of visualize things, to be able to make um, approximations. So it takes about a week to get from new moon to first quarter, about a week to get from first quarter to full, about a week to get from full quarter to third quarter. And you'll notice that this graphic, which I um, pulled because it is such a useful graphic, from um, Wikipedia, calls it last quarter because a lot of resources do. Third quarter is going to be more helpful to us. And then a week from third quarter to new moon again. Now, I want us to recognize that that's a lot of vocabulary all at once. I'm not expecting you to memorize it, but I do want you to feel more comfortable with it. The other big thing I want us to be able to understand, and we're going to work on that through a deeper look video that's going to come up, as well as the extended discussion of moon phases in the next video, I want us to recognize that the moon does not have eight phases. A lot of students get in their head from pictures um, like the previous couple of um, slides that there are eight phases. And that that's a little... Um, it's a little confusing for our brains to think that first quarter um, and then waxing crescent is just a, a phase that lasts the same amount of time. Instead, I want us to think about this, uh, this diagram that we introduced when we first introduced the, uh, the calendar, where we're breaking up the month into four special dates in the same way that the year has four special dates, the solstices and the equinoxes, the month has four special phases, new moon, then first quarter, then full moon, and then third quarter. And the entire chunk of time in between them, the entire uh, week in between each of these special phases, the moon is constantly changing how it looks every single time that we see it from one day to the next. And even like four hours later, there is a small difference that, that is noticeable in, in photographs. The entire chunk of the month, would we, we would be referring to waxing crescent or waxing gibbous or waning gibbous or waning crescent. But every single day is going to have changes, just like how... Winter refers to three months worth of time, but every single day there are changes. Um, and so we want to be able to make that connection to recognize that there are terms referring to special moments, and there are terms referring to big chunks of time, and we want to be able to distinguish them. So if you feel like you want more practice with moon phases after watching the Deeper Look video or reviewing this um, video a second time, uh, these are clickable links in our shared PDF um, that can get you to different interactives that might help you be able to feel a little more confident with moon phases. It's one of my favorite topics that we cover all semester, and it's one that we can really easily observe for ourselves without any kind of special equipment. So I invite you to explore the moon more than you have uh, before taking this class. I look forward to continuing this topic in the next video. I'll see you then.